Okay. So this is a recorded video. So if you object to being recorded, please log off. Um, I'm Robert Wingley. I am the director of the Northwest Earth and Space Sciences Pipeline, and I'm glad to have all of you uh, participate uh, in today's talk. We are going to announce at the end of this talk uh, what the new challenge is going to be. Uh, it's going to be called Roads on Mars Freestyle and it'll allow you to participate in a team exercise, uh, but keeping your social distancing intact. And so we'll have a lot of fun uh, for it. Uh, but today, since it's very appropriate about what's happening to the US and to the world with the coronavirus, we, it's my pleasure to introduce John Rummel, who is a senior scientist here at the SETI Institute um, and as a principal uh, for the Friday Harbor Partners Company. He's a member of the International Union of Biological Sciences to the International Science Council Committee uh, on Space Research, known as COSPAR, and is also a former chair of COSPAR for planetary protection and a former member of NASA Advisory Councils for uh, Planetary Protection. Uh, Dr. Rummel has previously worked at NASA headquarters and is also a senior scientist for the astrobiology program at NASA and is also NASA's planetary protection officer. He received his uh, PhD in community ecology and evolution from Stanford University and did his undergraduate degree in environmental biology from the University of Colorado. So take it away, John. All right, well, thank you very much, Robert. I'm pleased to be here and uh, of course, uh, one of the facets of my uh, previous experience is that I'm really good at resigning from the government, um, having resigned from the Navy once and NASA twice. So who knows, maybe I'll do that again sometime. Next slide. I'm here to talk about planetary protection, which is integral to answering astrobiology's big questions. And of course, a lot of people want to know how life began and evolved. Uh, and whether or not there's life elsewhere in the universe or whether or not we already own the rest of the universe. Uh, my guess is that there's somebody else who might object to that. And what's the future of life on Earth and beyond? Um, the answers to those questions can be found in our own solar system, at least uh, on first blush, and Mars might be a good place for that. Next slide. So this is a great solar system we live in. Not only do we have this beautiful paradise world called the Earth, uh, but we have uh, about nine other ocean worlds or more, depending on uh, exactly how you're counting them, uh, places that have, in some cases, uh, like Europa, more than three times as much ocean water as the ocean water on the Earth. Uh, lots of opportunities in the past on Mars for an ocean. Uh, we have Enceladus right now that's got enough water that it spews it out on a regular basis. Next slide. And we have Earth organisms that can live in extreme environments that were previously thought of as totally in unlivable. Um, we have microbes that reproduce at 121 degrees Celsius, which is quite hot. Um, water activity is 0.6 or above. This water uh, will support life on Earth everywhere. Ecosystems of a variety of different kinds, chemosynthesis, symbiosis, mineral organic processes. Um, look at deep sea hydrothermal vents, greater than 250 atmospheres, a place that University of Washington is specialized in, uh, and temperatures that are just below the boiling point of uh, water at 250 atmospheres, which is quite a lot hotter, about 350 degrees Celsius in some cases. Uh, in mines, you have a pH of minus 0 0.6, where the uh, more acid than any other place in the earth. Uh, and then organisms that live in high radiation environments um, almost as an afterthought, because of course they didn't, some of these high radiation environments are places like a, a nuclear power plant where the organisms certainly didn't evolve to live there, but are quite capable of it because of capabilities they have for other reasons. Next slide. So if we're going to go looking for life in the solar system, uh, Earth is an obvious one, so successful. We've already found life here on Earth. Mars is a, a good second bet. 
uh, not only because it's easier to get to than uh, the other ones, but because there's ample evidence for a large amount of liquid water on the surface in the past. Europa, three times the ocean water, uh, but very icy and very difficult to be in because it's bathed in a radiation environment supported by Jupiter. And then uh, everybody's recent famous, the little Enceladus, which is spewing out uh, organic compounds from what we can tell uh, into the uh, atmosphere of uh, Saturn and uh, putting together what's called the E-ring, uh, a place that you know, with some difficulty we can get to and we can land and we can go ahead and face it, see what's coming out. Next slide. So when I think about these missions, I think about biological invasions that come along. And part of my history is looking at invasive species in, in the Caribbean. And these are some examples of what happens if organisms are taken out of their normal environment and put into places that don't uh, actually support a healthy predator-prey relationship. In the case of uh, Australia, uh, one of the many problems that they have were rabbits that somebody let go on his farm because he missed them. Uh, and 24 gray rabbits uh, all of a sudden became millions and millions of rabbits. And in just 40 years, or I'm sorry, uh, in 41 years, he ended up with 2 million rabbits a year being killed off uh, and not lowering the population at all. And on the right, you can see the uh, picture of the uh, rabbits enjoying the Australian uh, water. Uh, but basically, the only way that they're contained right now is being an imported disease called rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus, uh, myxomycosis, which was given to the rabbits. And that keeps their numbers low. If they get too high, then they all die off. Next slide. Another invasion which isn't a pathogenic response, but it's just happenstance. Something that grows um, very well in the environment that it's been introduced into is called the kudzu vine, uh, also known as mile a minute vine. And what you see here is a, uh, you know, evidence of one year of kudzu being involved with this particular environment. Uh, and all of a sudden everything that was traceable before that is covered over with kudzu vines. Next slide. And kudzu didn't require any, uh, you know, co-evolution to do that. It's just what it does. Chestnut blight uh, was, in fact, something that was uh, infected by a parasite that it had never seen before, one that came from uh, Japanese chestnuts. And it had no particular immunity to that, and therefore, uh, the American chestnuts, which were amazing trees about the size of the ones here in the Pacific Northwest, all died off. And right now, the only time you see them is that uh, when they sprout from stumps and they get big enough, and then they die off. Next slide. So biological invasions are a problem. If you are looking at a space mission and you want to do $2 billion rovers to Mars, you don't want to study the stuff that you brought with you. Uh, if you want to study life in Florida, stay in Florida. Uh, don't take it to Mars and then bring it home and go Eureka. Life on Mars is just like life in Florida. Uh, it might be, uh, but you're not going to find it out that way. So avoiding contamination between the Earth and other worlds is an important part of planetary protection. Next slide. COSPAR is an organization called the Committee on Space Research. It uh, is basically a scientific organization that supports space research of a variety of different kinds from um, solar studies all the way into um, zero gravity life in space, et cetera. And back in 1958, it was founded uh, and currently its policy says, you know, avoid forward contamination, don't discover life we brought with us, avoid backward contamination, don't contaminate the earth and kill us all, uh, at least not for $2 billion and tailor the requirements that you put on missions by the target location and mission type. Next slide. So that's uh, COSPAR's uh, look at it. The Outer Space Treaty has some very formal wording, but Bart Simpson's got the wording that I always remember, which is that science clash should not end in tragedy, not for Mars and not for the Earth. Next slide. So there's an international agreement on planetary protection in the United Nations Outer Space Treaty in 1967, 
basically has a stipulation that we should conduct exploration to avoid harmful contamination. And also, and this is my favorite lawyer euphemism, adverse changes in the environment of the earth resulting from the introduction of extraterrestrial matter. That means not only avoid contamination associated with life, uh, but if you have an asteroid and you want to bring it home, don't drop it on somebody's house. Next slide. So we take a look at the Earth and Mars. This is a, approximately the, the correct sizing of those. We've learned a lot about Mars over the years, uh, but we're still learning a lot more. Mars uh, land area is the same as the land area on Earth, and it's got a, a great propensity to hide secrets under ice, under dust, and in uh, the volcanic uh, activity that's left over from a, an earlier time on Mars. Many different things for us to see there. Next slide. In 1975, the first successful lander ever on another planet uh, was Viking 1 and Viking 2 followed shortly thereafter. Uh, in 1976, it takes about seven months to get to Mars if you uh, go to slow boat. Uh, and they attempted on the Viking missions to grow Martian organisms in Earth-like conditions. But they didn't find contaminate chemical compounds usually associated with life. So they were able to show a reaction uh, in a mission, uh, an experiment called the label release experiment, but because they didn't see organic compounds, they said Mars doesn't have life. But we don't know whether or not the label release experiment had a positive uh, result because of Martian life, but we do know that our search for organic compounds in those days was flawed and we would have missed the organic compounds that we know about now. Next slide. Viking and planetary protection uh, were hand in glove uh, because the Viking missions wanted to go ahead and look for Earth organisms, but they didn't want to find them if they didn't come from Mars. Um, so they didn't want to look for Earth organisms, but they wanted to look like Earth-like organisms on Mars. Uh, and they wanted to make sure that they weren't studying life from Florida, you know, the theme I've already introduced. So once accepted, the requirements that they had to do was that the entire spacecraft was going to be heated to a level of 111.7 degrees Celsius for over 30 hours. Uh, and to do that, they had to build an oven on the side of the clean room, and they put the lander in a, uh, what I call an alumin, aluminum casserole dish. They put it in the oven and baked it, and it took about 54 hours for them to read spec temperature uh, for the right amount of time in the entire uh, system. Next slide. This is a bunch of guys at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena who are working on the Viking biology package. There's an amazing uh, miniaturization that happened when they put that together. But you can see something that, you know, from a modern day microbiological perspective, you would never allow to happen. These guys don't have face masks on. Um, these guys don't have gloves that are um, glued down. You take a look at the quality assurance guy, QA there, and his hairy arms probably have more microbes on them than the uh, capability of the instrument would have picked up. Nonetheless, they did a really good job. They baked this uh, experimental package for 100 hours at 118 degrees Celsius, and they put it into the spacecraft that you previously saw going into the uh, safe two oven or as a casserole dish. So they didn't detect anything that we would have thought of as earth organisms. Next slide. One of the things though that uh, you, know, you keep discovering things on earth, we didn't know about deep sea hydrothermal vents until seven months after Viking landed on Mars and did his experiments. There are many things associated with chemosynthesis on earth that we could have looked for uh, with Viking missions if we'd known about them and certainly want to look for if we go to Europa. Um, vents glow hot enough at 350 degrees Celsius that they provide light. And that light is actually tied in some circumstances, especially off the Endeavor Ridge here uh, in Washington. Uh, they provide enough light that photosynthetic bacteria can live on the ocean floor uh, without any other supplemental light source. Uh, so you have a variety of things that, light can, that life can do uh, in light uh, and in dark. And of course, uh, 
we love to look at giant tube worms. It'd be fun to find those on Europa. Uh, but many different things that are alive out there that we didn't ever expect to find at deep sea hydrothermal vents. Next slide. So after the Viking missions were done, uh, and some disappointment because we didn't find organic. Some people thought we shouldn't go back to Mars. Uh, some people thought that Mars was completely dead, um, cold, dead, and dry. It always has been. And it's very clear from more recent data that that's not the case, that life could certainly have existed on Mars, and that there are some places on Mars today that could support Earth life. But the requirements change uh, associated with the lander missions to Mars so then if you weren't carrying an instrument for investigation of extant Martian life, you don't have to be as clean as the Vikings were after they went into the oven. So you only have to make them as clean as they were before they went into the oven. Uh, and what you see here, the spacecraft looking down on itself is the Mars Exploration Rover. Uh, I believe that that's an opportunity. Uh, and this is actually, no, I'm sorry, that's spirit. And uh, this is before and after a, a cleaning event where the Mars winds came and cleaned off the solar panel. <coughs> if you want to look for life, or if you're going to bring back something um, uh, or go into a Martian special region, you have to be as clean as the Viking missions were after they came out of the other. Next slide. So this planetary protection legacy has trickled down into other missions. The ExoMars rover mission that the European Space Agency is supposed to launch, um, was supposed to launch this year, but it's going to wait two more years to do, uh, has a very, very clean uh, interior spaces because it's trying to look for life in a sample that it can get from two meters below the Martian surface, the deepest capability that we have on Mars right now. Something that we might be able to do a much better job on drilling that is. Uh, if we put humans into the loop. And then the Mars 2020 rover that the Jet Propulsion Laboratory is finishing and that NASA will launch to Mars this summer has a, a variety of requirements for clean, very clean uh, capabilities to collect samples, etc. Next slide. Mars special regions that I mentioned before are areas on Mars that might have a high potential for the existence of liquid water uh, or enough water uh, and enough warmth to support Earth life. That might give them uh, a high potential for the existence of Martian life forms, uh, but we don't define any of the Mars special regions that we've called out today as uh, any place associated with uh, Mars organisms. The lower limit for water activity for Earth organisms, we speculate is around 0.5. This is uh, called water activity. If you go to 100% relative humidity, in other words, a really nasty day in uh, the tropics, um, that's about as much water activity as you have, or if you're in a dense fog or something like that. Uh, lower limit for temperature, we speculate is minus 25 degrees Celsius. The uh, no upper limit that we found other than the water goes away if you get too hot. And we know that we've seen organisms that are alive and reproducing at temperatures below minus 18 degrees Celsius. So there's a little bit of a margin on the limit that we have. And there's a paper reference there that tells you more about it. Next slide. But we can uh, draw a map of Mars and look at places where you might be able to find both ice uh, and warmth. Um, and in the upper left of this slide is the PHX, which is the Phoenix landing site, which is a place that actually had relative humidity high enough during the, the night uh, and temperatures high enough during the day that they could support Earth life if Earth life were there. Uh, but they didn't have them simultaneously, so it was split across 24 hours. We don't know whether or not there are Earth lichens that can actually do that job uh, and live in a place like that. But uh, the Phoenix landing site has you know, told us that basically we have to worry about Earth organisms that can time slice and get part of what they need during the day and part of what they need during the night. 
And of course, we know that lichens might be able to do this. We know that humans do this all the time with the right kind of uh, technical support. Next slide. So if we're going to bring back a sample from Mars, we're dealing with something called backward contamination or back contamination. And you, an Earth return mission from Mars is currently classified in what Coast Guard calls a restricted Earth return. So there are restrictions on what you can do and how you can bring it back. An outbound mission has to meet contamination control requirements for life detection missions. So you don't actually study round trip life that you brought back uh, to Florida from Mars. Um, but the provision should avoid false positive indications in life detection and hazard determination protocol. What you're going to do is you're going to bring back a sample, you're going to contain it so that you don't have problems like we have right now with coronavirus and a, a false positive uh, is something that you don't want to see either. So you want things to be very clean. The biohazard protocol, uh, that what you're going to do to prove that a Mars sample is safe on Earth uh, is something that doesn't do well if there are too many false positives and you keep discovering Earth life that you brought with you. Uh, that, and of course, a false negative is the worst thing you can imagine, which is you say it's okay, uh, but it's not. Excellent. Other things that uh, the mission must do is break the chain of contact with Mars. Uh, that's the target body in this case. And to make sure that dust from Mars, for example, doesn't get brought back on the outside of the spacecraft. Uh, so we have to make sure that if uh, material and if hardware that's touched Mars, it doesn't uh, get returned to the Earth's biosphere or to the moon. Uh, which we don't want to make more complex. The moon itself was, is not something we're worried about contaminating, but you don't want to bring set back something uh, and have people work out on it and then tell them they have to stay on the moon because they discovered something that was dangerous in a Mars sample. So making sure that you isolate uh, hardware and you bring back a samples contained uh, and then you discover with a program of light detection, biohazard testing, whether there's a problem with it or whether it needs to stay contained. Next slide. All of this could be uh, done relatively cheaply, and I'm talking about about 15% of normal cost, uh, by providing for it early and often. Um, parts qualifications, so if you're gonna heat something up, all the parts don't fail. If the part's not qualified above 70 degrees C, uh, may need to have something else done, uh, or there are a variety of different ways to uh, sterilize parts, not just heat. Um, start clean and keep things cleaner, and that's one way to go. And then dry heat uh, seems to be the easiest way to decontaminate things now. Uh, and certainly military hardware is all heated up to temperatures over what Viking was heated up to. Next slide. The problem we have, of course, is that signs of life may be very small. Viruses uh, can be, uh, they may not be alive, uh, but they are replicating in a host. Uh, and if you find viruses, that will tell you that the host may be somewhere nearby. And there'll be many more viruses than you will be hosts. <coughs> they won't necessarily be, uh, you know, viable. But if you find something uh, like a virus, you want to make sure that uh, it doesn't have any effect on humans uh, or any other part of the Earth's biosphere. Um, eliminating living organisms uh, is a challenge, uh, whether or not there's something like the viruses or something like the much larger tardigrades. Um, you don't want to put them into places on Mars uh, where they might grow and thrive or where they might give you a false positive indication that something else is there. So you have to be pretty careful about how you go about looking for life uh, in a place that might actually shelter life if we took it there. Next slide. Future flights to Mars may uh, involve humans. And there are a variety of things uh, that we can do on that. Uh, NASA was dedicated to a, a journey to Mars before. And the, the major questions don't change very much. Was Mars home to microbial life? Is it still? Could it be a safe home for humans? Uh, or what can we learn about life elsewhere in the cosmos and other planets and other worlds outside of our solar system? 
And what can it tell us about the Earth, past, present, or future? What lessons can we learn from a, an entire planet that's about the size of Earth's land area? Next slide. So this is uh, oftentimes what uh, people have in mind when they think about a human mission to Mars, something sparsely supported, uh, a nice little camp out hut, a rover so you can get around, presumably a space suit that you can clean off if you want to go inside with it, if it needs a little bit of uh, additional maintenance, and one that allows you to move around. We're severely challenged in the spacesuit market for Mars right now because Mars has uh, got a 0.38 of Earth's gravity, as you probably all know, and the suit that we're looking at right now is supposed to mass at 140 kilograms. So divide that by approximately a third of 0.4, and you still have a pretty heavy suit, uh, but the mass is the same. So you're, the weight uh, pressing down on Mars isn't as much of an issue as starting and stopping and all the effort it's going to take to do that. Uh, also, uh, of course, dust affects uh, EVA spaces in a major way, and we have to learn much more about how to handle dust. It was one of the limiting factors on the Apollo mission. People's suits started to break down, or as John Young, the Apollo 16 astronaut, said to me, uh, they start to, or Apollo 15, they start to grind to a halt. Next slide. So the other group that people are thinking about are groups like this. This is a, uh, a variety of people who are looking at the Glacier National Park in uh, Southern Ireland. Alaska, and they find it very interesting. Next slide. The question is whether or not you can get a similar group of people to want to go look at Mars. Next slide. And if so, I mean, we need to be aware that we all live in a sea of living organisms. Humans and the commensal microorganisms on which they rely uh, are basically all of us. About 50% of your cells in your body are non-human microbes. Uh, and they're approximately 10 trillion of them uh, in and on each of our bodies. So this is you know, bigger than the stimulus package uh, that the Congress is working on right now. So when you add humans as autonomous microbial growth capabilities into the search for life, you uh, basically put yourself on a, a real difficult path. Um, and whether or not you actually put the question of life on Mars on a reach for an extended or limited period of time depends on how well you manage it. Next slide. One of the things that uh, is obvious to people who pay attention to the human spaceflight program is that Mars is going to require a much better life support system than the one that we have on the International Space Station. And there's a, a point or two at uh, here, there's a great presentation by Lane Carter and Chris Brown about the challenges of the life support system when you're dealing with Earth microbes uh, associated with the astronauts and how that contaminates things. Next slide. And just to give you an idea of what it looks like, on the left is a place where people store their workout gear when they're not uh, running in place or doing whatever they do on the ISS. Uh, and that dark discoloration is uh, basically some kind of a mold growing in the uh, panel of the International Space Station. And there's some pretty nasty microbes that are found in the International Space Station. Uh, some of them don't have immediate pathogenic effects, Burkholderi in the uh, water supply, but some of them could. Uh, and you have to worry about that. There are actually parts of the life support system that are overgrown with Earth microbes after only three weeks of use and have to be replaced. Next slide. So we think about human exploration. We can go back to the organization Coast Bar Committee on Space Research and see what they you know, recommend. And the intent of the policy that they espouse for humans is the same whether or not a mission to Mars is conducted robotically or with human explorers. But clearly, you can't have the same capabilities. Um, you, you're not going to put human explorers in an oven and heat them up until all the microbes are dead, obviously. But safeguarding the Earth still has to be the highest priority in planetary protection. So when you send people to Mars, 
they have to have some idea of what the unknowns are uh, before they'll consent to that in a willing way because you wouldn't want somebody with the sniffles or some other difficulty similar to our current coronavirus to keep somebody from being brought back from Mars if they went there on a tourist visit. Uh, if they're going there as explorers, we know that their capabilities uh, can contribute to astrobiological exploration. We'd like to do that. Um, for a landed mission conducting surface operations, it's not going to be possible for all human associated processes and mission operations to be conducted with an entirely closed system. And so crew members, tourists, whoever, exploring Mars, will inevitably be exposed to Martian materials. One of the things we'd like to know first is whether or not there are Martian organisms that are in those materials uh, from the get-go. An example return mission from Mars is one great way to think about it. Next slide. So this is one human exploration concept where you have a laboratory, a hab, uh, much like the one shown earlier, a place where your robot can be very clean uh, and you bring you back samples that you can study in the laboratory. Uh, and also you protect other sites on Mars from contamination by human. The size of that oval there, uh, which would be the limit of how far human activities are going to affect things, uh, is unknown. And of course, it will depend on the wind and a variety of other kinds of considerations. Next slide. Uh, and of course, <laughs> the other thing people want to do, as I mentioned earlier, is to drill. Uh, and you're drilling for a couple of different reasons. One, you'd like to know about what's under the surface and whether or not there's life there, whether or not there's ice there so that you can have drinking water, uh, or whether or not there are organic compounds there that are indicative of past life. That sort of thing you'd really want to do. And all of those activities to drill down are going to provide a little bit of heat. So if you do have permafrost uh, under the Martian soil, you're going to liquefy things a little bit. A uh, number of other constraints that you have to worry about. Next slide. But we know that humans are very good at finding biosignatures and noticing uh, inadequacies. And all of these uh, illustrations here are from people who explore caves on Earth. Uh, and that blue goo that you see coming out of the rock there is a, a copper subsurface organism, basically. Um, uses the copper that are in those rocks to make a living. And all of these uh, different kinds of organisms that people look at, poofballs we call them, and these other things that are there are very much uh, alive and you know, well and living in places that we would consider to be extreme. Next slide. And humans are, are very good at looking at certain things, but sometimes those things are dangerous. Here's somebody looking for life in sulfuric acid in a cave in uh, Mexico. Uh, on the right, there's a fumarolic cave in the ice on the top of Mount Rainier, Washington. Uh, and you know, a dangerous place to go into, uh, but a place where you still find uh, certain kinds of microbes living and living happily. And the uh, large uh, caves that they have can be extremely large and require very flexible exploration. Next slide. And that lower left uh, journey, those were people in there. And this is a cave in Mexico, the Nica Caves, that have incredibly large calcite deposits. Uh, and those people are real size, and so are those calcite deposits. Uh, it's not a science fiction movie. It looks like it could be, uh, but it's not. <laughs> and that's at 100% relative humidity. Next slide. Very difficult to do with a robot, but there are other reasons to be concerned about what you take to Mars. So for example, uh, Earth bacteria uh, not only would confuse a, a search for life, but they could actually put certain kinds of resources off limits to human. Uh, the current um, civil engineering application of bacteria to be self-healing agents in sustainable concrete and a variety of different kinds of materials. Microbes can knit things together, uh, but at the same time, they would destroy the subsurface water deposit um, because they would basically find 
uh, a certain number of minerals that they could go ahead and um, calcify, for example, and cut off the uh, aquifer from human use. Next slide. You want to make sure what you take there is the problem. Um, this is a kind of a long quote from uh, two of the people who started the whole planetary protection quarantine concerns back in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, but it addresses whether or not you can actually use Mars for other than science. Uh, and for example, if you wanted to terraform Mars and make it more like the Earth, um, we would want to attempt to revise the atmospheres of Mars to make it more habitable. Uh, what you don't want to do is have a bunch, a bunch of Earth bacteria left around uh, that if you did that, those things would proliferate and actually prove dangerous. Next slide. So in my opinion, if you don't take steps to limit human associated contamination, the reasons and the rationale to go and explore Mars evaporate, uh, like frost and utopia finish in a summer afternoon. And on the right, there is a, a picture of Utopia Phoenicia on Mars, where Viking 2 landed. Uh, and that's all water frost uh, on the surface. Um, if you were to ignore the potential for human contamination and science contamination and colonization, are both at risk. Next slide. So humans on Mars, you have to have serious consideration of limiting contamination that would corrupt or destroy evidence on other extraterrestrial life. Uh, you also don't want to mask evidence of Mars organisms. Uh, if those are places today uh, where Mars organisms could live, you don't want to contaminate those uh, and have them warded out with your microbes. Uh, both qualitative and quantitative requirements are necessary for human spaceflight to be successful. And a variety of different organizations that are spaceflight organizations are working to do it, develop human mission requirements. Next slide. You know, human missions aren't what Elon Musk is really talking about as much as he's talking about settlements on Mars and making Mars a place where people can live. And it's a bold vision. Uh, and it, of course, in the long run, depends not only on uh, humans to enact it, but on Mars having some capabilities to self-generate material. And so the red arrow here points to the uh, Mars habitat, the dome where you're going to live. So that all you get uh, on Mars is not just a t-shirt that says, I came all this way and all I got was a uh, t-shirt. Um, but you want to go ahead and make sure that Mars is a, a habitable place for people who want to go look at it. Next slide. Plant-based life support systems are essential. If you saw the Martian, uh, you know that Mark Watney uh, was able to grow potatoes for a while and it um, enabled him to survive. Um, the problem with plants is, well, they have an on switch and an off switch. You can't use the on switch once you use the off switch. So uh, you have to be very good about growing plants in a decidedly formal way. Uh, and you might want to have multiple crops and multiple uh, harvest of those crops to make sure that we have a defensible place. Next slide. But what you don't want is somebody to bring in a, a plant pathogen to your greenhouse, which is sustaining your entire uh, settlement, uh, tourist activity, uh, scientific base, or whatever. Uh, so you want to make sure that you control Earth microbes coming to Mars, even if you're not worried about looking for life on Mars, or you think that Mars life is no longer uh, active. Uh, Earth life is active, and it's not always benign. Next slide. And the other thing you might want to think about is a planetary park system, uh, something for Mars that would preserve the unique sites that we see that we would like to go ahead and continue to explore without the presence of human explorers uh, and with the, the most careful possible condition. So John, I was going to say it's about 40 minutes. And if we could wrap it up so we could have the students talk to you, that'd be great. A couple more minutes. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm just about done. So I. What can I do for you? I keep going, but just got to do it. If you could finish up in a couple of minutes, that'd be great.
So we could get questions into you. Yeah, well, anyway, the final wrap up slide uh, planetary protection helps you to ensure that science isn't compromised, safeguards against biosphere from harmful contamination. Uh, these things are embodied in the Outer Space Treaty of 1967 and Coast Bar since 1958 has been looking at that. So we want to eliminate forward and backward contamination. Next slide. And uh, let's not destroy our opportunity to learn about life elsewhere. Next slide. And certainly let's protect this uh, planet we live on. Ready for questions? Thank you. Great job. Um, so what we're going to do is just ask people to uh, type in your questions into the chat box and I'll read them out to our speaker and he'll answer them for you. So type away. Uh, so Nate is asking, what is a biosphere starting off? So my internet is unstable here, so hopefully you can hear me. But the first question was, what is a biosphere? Is So maybe Mary or Chris could take over because I can't hear anybody and there was a question about what a biosphere is, and the biosphere is just that living part of the external Earth, uh, where we and all the other organisms are alive. And it goes from some uh, you know, kilometers below the lower limits of the ocean, uh, where we still find microbes down, you know, uh, as far as we can drill, uh, and it goes to the top of the atmosphere. So that's what a biosphere is. So, so Newton asked, um, he was told that there was a biosphere on the moon. Is that correct? Uh, the moon doesn't have a biosphere. It's got a faint atmosphere. Um, but we've never found anything alive on the moon uh, to distinguish it as a biosphere, as opposed to uh, just a great place to have uh, trace gases. Um, and eventually, those all go to the poles where the cold uh, craters uh, attract um, the warmer atmospheric gases and freeze it in place. Okay, there was a question earlier on, well, you made a statement to uh, in the last few slides about switching the plants on and off. What did that actually mean? This was a question. Yeah, uh, so if you've got a wheat seed, uh, if you provide it with the proper conditions, it will turn on and start growing wheat. Um, and that's called germination. Um, and then you can go ahead and stop it from growing uh, either just by eating it or by heating it up or something along that line. Um, but once you eat the wheat, uh, it's no longer capable of germination. So that's the off switch. Uh, and a lot of engineers uh, get worried about it because they don't see any way to put wheat plants on hold once they've germinated and want to go. So you have to be very careful about managing uh, plant growth. Uh, and we're very lucky in Washington to have uh, abundant harvests, et cetera, but not everything will grow here. Okay. Uh, Taryn wanted to know how much gas uh, is in the uh, Mars atmosphere. Say again? Uh, how much gas is in the Mars atmosphere? In which atmosphere? Sorry. The Martian atmosphere. So how much gas is in the Martian atmosphere? Well, another one question is, what is the Martian atmosphere made of? Okay. <laughs> the Martian atmosphere is uh, something that is about 1% the atmospheric pressure of the Earth. Uh, actually, every place we've landed, uh, it's been enough pressure that it would keep water from boiling, uh, but certainly not enough to keep water from uh, evaporating. Uh, but it's uh, about 98% uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, it does have a small amount of oxygen in it, and it's got nitrogen, uh, and it basically has got argon as the other gas. Uh, 
Uh, and so it's a very low pressure and unusual atmosphere. But if you were an Escherichia coli bacterium, uh, of the kind that we carry around in our gut, you would find enough oxygen on Mars uh, if you were there. What you wouldn't find is the nice cozy temperature that we provide in our gut. Okay, so I'm going to uh, combine the questions from Ronan and Virginia here. But there was a question about what kind of animals or living organisms would you expect to find um, on Mars? Well, I, you wouldn't find anything that uh, would be, you know, actually uh, macroscopic. You wouldn't be able to see the life that you would find on Mars, except for uh, if they discolored an entire area, much like the, the blue copper sulfate that I showed earlier. Uh, you know, the, the Viking missions actually carry in seismometers, uh, and the current InSight mission has a, a really capable seismometer on Mars. And there's nothing that sounds at all like elephants walking around in the background or something like that. Um, now, the science fiction book that uh, animals can jump really high on Mars, uh, we all kind of wave to Edgar Rice Burroughs, the author at the uh, turn of the century and uh, later who had John Carter, the uh, warlord of Mars. Uh, none of that's actually played out for real, but great fiction if you want to read it. Okay. Um... So, um, let's see, Maxim uh, wanted to know, can you explain a little bit more deal, detail about what's required to grow plants on Mars? Uh, could you say that once again? I'm sorry, some of the yep. workers. Um, so, what uh, is required to grow plants on Mars? Well, I mean, if you want to grow something, uh, you need pressure. You're going to need to have uh, some kind of uh, liquid supply. And, and a lot of times people have been looking at what's called a nutrient film technique, which basically circulates uh, a nutrient solution to the plant's roots, but uh, doesn't actually require any soil whatsoever. Soil is good for some kinds of support. Um, foam plugs can do the same job itself. Mm -hmm. And you can grow lots of different organisms, lots of different plants in a uh, hydrocultural. Uh, yeah, just basically um, having the uh, capability to have a pump uh, moving the nutrients around and to have a lighting system that will provide enough light, uh, which nature provides on Mars on a 24 hour basis. Uh, and you can grow pretty much whatever you can grow on Earth. Fabulous. Um, so I'm going to probably jump on this question and help answer it, but there was a question from Taryn. Do you expect the Mars 2020 expedition to um, go on with coronavirus? And um, for all the students there, NASA is trying to do its best to uh, continue functioning to get Mars 2020 and make the launch date. It's a high priority. Uh, but already there have been uh, reports of uh, NASA staff being infected with coronavirus. And so they're doing their best, but we don't know uh, uh, what the final status will be until things settle down. So they're working as hard as they can, but we don't know what the final result will be. And I don't know whether you, John, wanted to say something about the coronavirus and Mars 2020. Yeah, Mars 2020, I think, is, you know, as much as possible, um, testing the team and making sure that people that show any kind of symptoms uh, are isolated from the team. But they, they're they well staffed, and they have the right kind of people who are going on. When the Europeans said that their ExoMars mission wasn't going to go, they were able to cite coronavirus concerns uh, specifically because the spacecraft is being assembled in Turin, Italy, uh, and it's supposed to be operated in northern Italy as well. Uh, and that is something that is under complete lockdown. The Italian government has told people no amount of work can be done, so they weren't able to complete that spacecraft. But their biggest problem was that they had parachutes that wouldn't work. Uh, and so NASA was helping them with their parachute tests, but they actually had to put out, put off the uh, subsequent parachute testing 
uh, due to the coronavirus. So they're not sure whether or not they actually have a parachute that will work. But this is pretty late in the day to be wondering about that. Okay. I do want to know, can the off switch be not giving a plant what it needs after it germinates then? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, if you give um, plants the, the right conditions, they'll grow pretty well anywhere that they are. Uh, we've been able to germinate wheat plants in microgravity on the International Space Station, on Mir Station before that. Um, we haven't had any problems with that. Of course, if you're in microgravity, you use a different nutrient delivery system um, because you can't expect the nutrients to stay in the bottom of a tray or something like that. Uh, but hydroponic solutions seem to be uh, quite well suited to life in space. And it was kind of, you know, eventually uh, they got around to growing salad vegetables uh, on the International Space Station. And that's quite popular with the crew. Uh, there was an old story about the uh, Russian cosmonauts who were supposed to be monitoring a, an onion plant growth experiment uh, that was supported by the Institute of Biomedical Problems in Moscow. And they kept on reporting how well it was doing and what a great plant it was uh, well after they'd already eaten it. Okay. Um, so if you wanted to know, um, is, you mentioned argon. So what is argon and is it dangerous? Argon is a uh, gas that is not dangerous. It's one of the heavier of the uh, gases that are um, basically like helium, argon um, yeah, is inert. Uh, it, they call it a noble gas because it doesn't mix with any other uh, gases and cause any uh, really reactions. Um, so argon is uh, easy to live with, uh, and in fact, um, you know, is, doesn't represent any difficulty on Mars. It just adds to the picture. So some of you guys have asked several questions, and I want to just ask uh, questions from some people who haven't had a go yet. So E one one nine four three zero is asked: Is there a facility in place now that is designed to handle samples coming from Mars that could? likely prevent a contamination situation? No, it, it's actually not been available yet. Um, the two things that you want in such a facility is the ability to contain a Mars sample at a very high level, very similar to the kinds of biosafety level four facilities that are in operation throughout the world. The difficulty of using one of those is they're used to doing animal experimentation and having benign microbes that they come in and out. Uh, and what you want for a Mars receiving facility, uh, a sample handling facility, if you might call it that, is something to be very, very clean. And that's uh, the most important part because you don't want to have Earth microorganisms get into your containment facility and, and be contained because then they look like they came from Mars. Uh, and that's what we don't have right now. But the planning for that is underway to support a Mars sample return mission uh, in the early 2030s. Yeah, I was going to say Mars 2020 is the precursor and that it's collecting samples. Presumably, I think there's a follow on mission that would try and get the samples up to orbit. And then the final mission would be to get that's those samples from orbit back to, Mars, uh, to Earth. So that's the plan. Um, like, and like you said, it's probably a decade away to complete, but we're moving towards that. So that'll be an exciting time. Let's see yeah, who hasn't asked the question. Um, Justin wants to know, do you think coronavirus will leave our atmosphere? Uh, I'm not an expert on coronavirus. <laughs> All right, how about this one from Christopher? He wants to know, what does microgravity mean? Microgravity is uh, basically, you know, a, the acceleration that is felt in the International Space Station uh, by things moving around, uh, it's much less than one gravity. It's about one millionth, or I'm sorry, yeah, one millionth of a, a normal gravitational attraction. The point about using microgravity as opposed to weightlessness is that uh, the astronauts themselves 
impart accelerations uh, on the spacecraft of the International Space Station that are larger than the normal forces that you would feel if you were just uh, orbiting the Earth. Okay, I'm gonna have um, the last question from Ahashman. He wanted to know how are they going to clean the rover if they can't use heat? Well, many of the rovers like the Mars Exploration Rovers, uh, like the uh, Mars Science Laboratory, et cetera, they will use heat on parts of them before they put them together. Uh, and then whether they have a containment capability, um, some kind of a removable shield, uh, much as they did in the Phoenix mission, or whether they do it some other way, um, you have the ability to encapsulate the rover, uh, and instead of using heat, you can expose it to vapor hydrogen peroxide, for example, a uh, kind of a nasty mix that smells like bleach um, and that kills all the organisms on the surface of the rover. Uh, you have to, of course, plan for that in advance. Uh, one of the things that the normal lubricants that you use on the wheels of the spacecraft, they don't like that kind of uh, you know, vapor hydrogen peroxide, but you can uh, engineer to replace those lubricants uh, with clean lubricants after the vapor hydrogen peroxide treatment. So I'm gonna actually take the liberty of asking the last question. And that is, I thought I saw an article that they said, that said that there was some mold on one of the Mars spacecraft. Is that correct or not correct? Well, so the, the spacecraft that we have um, have all kinds of different microbes on them, um, still very clean, but the, the specifics of what kind of microbe happens to be there, uh, are they're not controlled. So we limit the number of spacecraft on a, a Mars rover right now to basically 300,000 surface spores of one kind or another. Uh, along with those spores can come, you know, an occasional mold or something like that. Uh, mostly they're not a problem because they require um, moisture and they require heat to go ahead and activate. We can detect those, um, but we're not concerned about the way we use them on Mars right now, which is of course bathed in ultraviolet light, uh, and we don't go to places with moisture and heat. Uh, right. But in the long run, we do have to be careful about you know, how we deal with organisms that we're currently not counting. And for that, we talk about putting together a passenger list so we know everybody who goes to Mars, uh, okay. both now and in the past. Okay, thank you, John. I really appreciate your time, and I'm sure everybody will appreciate what you've talked today. It was really a great and informing uh, talk today and I appreciate it. So we're going to end the recording of this one and then uh, we are going to discuss the new challenge uh, coming up next. Um, so if, if um, we can end the recording and we will bring up